upcoming Older Book Luncheon Colloquium on this coming Tuesday, February the 2nd, at 12.15 p.m. here in Older Book Centre, featuring the 2015 Ashe Africa Grand Recipients. Welcome to today's Older Book Luncheon Colloquium, titled Exploring Environmental Issues in Southeast Asia, a report back from the Environmental Asia Clinic Trip. I was over there. Uh, I had the first time at Audubon Center for Modern Languages and International Relations at Pomona College for having us over to present on our learning journey to Sarawak and Singapore. My name is Johan Lim. I'm a government and history double major at Claremont McKenna College. I am originally from Singapore and I will be your student chair for today. So some of you may ask, why? Johan, do you choose to go, of all places, during your winter break to Singapore? <laughs> you can like, research or anywhere else. And then to that, I'll say the food in Singapore is really good. <laughs> so that's why I went home. But I'll tell you why in my presentation later today. And presenting alongside me today will be Professor Jim Taylor from Pomona's Theatre Department and Stephanie Steinbrecher, a Scripps College senior, environmental analysis minor, and English major. Mm, all right. Do you know that the three of us are not the only environmental Asia research fellows here today, and many of us are seated amongst you in the crowd. In fact, they may be seated right beside you. We should turn around and <laughs> later. Uh, so what exactly is environmental Asia? Like, what's the whole point of, you know, environmental Asia? Like, I'm pretty sure the Henry Liu Foundation didn't just toss out $100,000 to anybody you ask. So they must have seen some, you know, hope in the vision that we laid out in our guiding principles, which I will now turn to. So the first guiding principle that we have is to create a space for production of knowledge, the interaction between nature, the built environment, and human populations in Asia. Something which we interacted closely while we were in Sarawak, Malaysia, and Singapore. Singapore. The second guiding principle is to establish a firm foundation for the continuous creation of knowledge about Asia and the environment through the building of a robust infrastructure of expert networks that will ideally facilitate ongoing cross-disciplinary communications and exchange of resources. I know, big words. Long sentence. <laughs> but do note that this exchange of knowledge and resources isn't just limited to within the five colleges in Claremont. It also extends to our regional partner, Whittier College, and also our partners across the globe, Yale and U.S. College in Singapore, who kindly hosted us for our clinic trip over January. And our final and guiding principle is to strive to increase the capacities of faculty members and students alike to effectively influence debates on environmental issues, as well as present innovative solutions to environmental challenges. This will manifest in the policy paper and the communication model that we will be producing by the end of this academic year. And with that, I will now hand over the time to Professor Jim Taylor. Kindly withhold any questions till the end of the presentation as time has been allotted for Q&A. Jim, thank you. Thank you, Johan. Uh, before I begin, I want to take this opportunity to thank Karen Mack, who is the Administrative Assistant of the EnviroLab um, ASIA program. Uh, unfortunately, Karen is not here today. She sprained her ankle, probably, probably doing EnviroLab business. Uh, but, but she, uh, while all of us were uh, having a wonderful time in Singapore and Borneo, she was very capably keeping the home fires burning. And, and I wanted to take the opportunity to thank her. So if you see her, if you know her, please thank her and please let, let her know that, that we, we uh, are grateful for, for all that she did to help us. So my task is to provide a general overview of the, the EnviroLab Asia Clinic trip. Uh, and then we're, we're, we're letting the, the real uh, heavy lifting being done by s students Stephanie and uh, Johan. From January 4th to January 14, 2016, more than 30 EnviroLab fellows and guests participated in a research clinic trip to Malaysia, Borneo, and Singapore. Participants included students from the Claremont Colleges and Yale National University of Singapore, which is a new liberal arts college entirely within the campus of the much larger National University of Singapore. As well as an interdisciplinary group of faculty members from 
both of these institutions. Prior to the trip, Inquire Black Fellows have been organized into two research clusters, one focusing on policy issues and one focusing on arts and communication. Our pre-planned goal was the study of the environmental and social effects of palm oil cultivation in Southeast Asia, specifically in Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. Although we learned a great deal about palm oil while on our trip, we were surprised to learn a great deal more about the people and the, of the region and the complex environmental and social issues that they face. Our trip began in Miri, Indonesia. I mean Miri, Malaysia, on the island of Borneo. So this is this is Singapore. <laughs> Los Angeles is way over here. Um, Miri is located on the northern coast of Malaysian Borneo, uh, just west of the Sultanate of Brunei, approximately 600 miles uh, east of Kuala Lumpur, which is the capital of Peninsula Mal Malaysia. Uh, Miri is in, the, is in the province of Sarawak. Uh, the two of Malaysian pro Borneo provinces, Sarawak and Sabah, are semi-independent uh, provinces of uh, Malaysia, uh, and the, they share uh, the shared Borneo with the Kalimantan provinces of Indonesia, as well as the Sultanate of, Brun Sultanate of Brunei, which is right here. Good. So the first component of our trip. Uh, was a three-day excursion some 200 miles upriver, exploring palm oil cultivation along the Barren River, which flows from the central mountains of Borneo north to Miri and the South China Sea. Our hosts for this excursion were the indigenous Cayenne people who live along the Barren River. This extraordinary group became our drivers, boat pilots, cooks, guides, dancers and musicians, and last but not least, very good friends. <coughs> the Kayan are a subset of a larger ethnic group known as the Dayak, a group of primarily non-Malay speaking, non-Muslim people who inhabit the central Borneo region. The Dayak are thought to have lived in this region for over 4,000 years. Theirs is a, subs is a subsistence culture in which they rely on the growing of lowland rice and other crops, as well as hunting and fishing. As late as the 1950s, the Dayak practiced headhunting. Thankfully, that practice has been eliminated in modern times. For many centuries, the Dayak, the Kayan, and other Dayak people held animist religious beliefs. Today, most are devout Christians. The Kayan, like many other Dayak peoples, live in fascinating communities known as longhouses, lengthy structures about the length of a football field, which typically house an entire village. The longhouses are situated beside rivers and or streams, providing water, transportation, and food for the inhabitants. The Kayan people along the Barum River are faced with an enormous challenge to their centuries-old way of life. In order to promote further economic development in the region, the state government of Sarawak has announced plans to build one of a, of a, number, one of a series of huge hydroelectric dams on the river. This is a picture of the first dam of the series, the, the Bakun Dam. It's huge. Um, the dam would inundate numerous communities of Cayenne and other peoples, forcing these people to relocate to higher ground, and further fragmenting of people hanging on to their culture in our fast-moving, globalized world. The inspirational response of the Cayenne people 
to these plans has been to actively blockade the building of the dam. They have established roadblocks on the major roads to the dam site and are fighting the construction of the dam on the ground, in the state government, and in court. This blockade, extraordinary for the region, has been successful for over three years. <clears throat> the Cayenne and other indigenous pe people, peoples in this region are further challenged by the prolif proliferation of palm oil cultivation in the region. Typically, palm oil concessions are awarded by private companies, to private companies, by the state government without regard to the native customary rights of the local peoples. The existing forest is cleared through clear cutting and burning techniques, thus causing greatly decreased biodiversity, biodiversity in a region which is thought by some scientists to hold as much as 3% of the biodiversity of the world. Hunting and fishing are adversely affected, and air and water quality, quality are significantly diminished. Cheap labor for the palm oil plantations is, provide, is mainly provided by migrant workers, not the indigenous people. The migrant workers are from in Indonesia, thus further endangering the viability of the long-term viability of the indigenous people. Thus, for the most part, the hefty profits of palm oil cultivation are never shared with the original inhabitants, inhabitants of the land. Along the Barren River, we were surprised to learn that traditional logging also presents a significant threat to the Barren River people and the other peoples who live along the river. Although everywhere we traveled, and this is a perfect example, uh, that we traveled was especially green and lush. It was primarily new growth forest, still actively being logged by private companies in a business model very similar to that employed by the palm oil concessionaires. The destruction of the local environment by the wealthy at the expense of the indigenous people continued in this way. Sorry, I'm one, one slide ahead. Let's leave it here. <laughs> Once the Barren River field work was completed, the majority of the rest of our trip was focused on more formal academic type meetings. In Miri, we participated in a mini, mini conference organized by the Save Rivers Network, an NGO fighting the construction of, me of hydroelectric mega dams throughout Malaysian Borneo. Also in Miri, we attended a presentation by Brimas, Borneo Research Institute, entitled Protecting Indigenous People's Land Rights Using the Court System. One of the challenges that the indigenous people have is that of access to education and access to legal representation. Our meetings in Singapore included a revelatory meeting with, and kind of conspiratorial meeting with Peck Chabot and his colleague, who are leaders of the popular and somewhat radical Singapore-based NGO People's Movement to Stop Hayes. I think this is a really compelling image. Uh, the, the Hayes is created by uh, the burning of the Indonesian and Malaysian rainforests. And most, of, most of the Hayes ends up, ends up in Singapore. That's quite a, a public health problem. Uh, we also listened to a presentation by Mr. Balu Perumal, head of the Conservation District for the Malaysian Nature Society, who gave a presentation on forest conservation in BirdLife's Forest of Hope site, Belum Temengor Forest in Peninsula Malaysia. And we had a fact-filled meeting with Dr. Madhau Rao, regional advisor of the Wildlife Conservation Society who spoke on wildlife conservation projects in the region with a special emphasis on her approaches to science-based conservation projects. The most challenging meeting of our trip, I think the fellows would agree, was a somewhat or even quite tense encounter with sustainability officials of Wilmar. Wilmar is, a similar, is, as you can see, uh, a Singapore agribusiness group, which is simultaneously one of the largest palm oil producers in the world and the self-contained leader in, of the industry-based RSPO, 
the Roundtable for Sustainable Palm Oil. We held our own in a tense, fast-paced, give-and-take two-hour meeting. Well, in Singapore, we also went on two formal field trips. The most insightful was a fascinating visit to Kwan Ha Organic Farms, a leader in Singapore's important but endangered organic film farming industry. Very, very little of the food in Singapore comes, is grown in Singapore, it's grown in a country, in neighboring countries, uh, and the, the organic farms are hanging on, uh, uh, barely, and other farms as well. Uh, uh, the government wants to use the land for other purposes. So it's a fascinating uh, trip for us. We also had a tour, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, of Bollywood vegetables, uh, veggies, paradise on earth, uh, a large outdoor garden which builds itself as a food museum. Uh, there, a quirky but well-versed guide gave us a wide variety of interesting and anecdotal information about many of the more popular food plants of the region. Our clinic trip concluded at, at National University of Singapore with a series of in-depth debriefings about what we had seen and heard in our action-packed 10-day journey. In our respective research clusters, we shared a myriad of thoughts, insights, and experiences, and ben began to map out the individual and collective work before us. All of us involved were thrilled enlightened and challenged over the course of the trip. And we can't wait to see the fruits of our labors and that of our collaborators as they unfold over the weeks and months ahead. We are so grateful for the important investments that EnviroLab Asia has made in each of us. And we hope that the long-term long returns that we will, recreate, we will cre create on these investments will be both significant and lasting. I'll leave you with the Cayenne children. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for that. Um, as Johan announced earlier, I'm Stephanie. I'm a student at Scripps College. I'm also an Enviro Lab Asia Fellow with the Arts and Communications uh, cluster. And I would like to talk a little bit about my reflections of the Malaysian component of our trip. Um, and after that, Johan will talk about uh, the Singapore parks and, and other reflections. Um, all right, so first, uh, I want to return to this photo that Jim had displayed earlier. Um, this was taken from our first night in Sarawak. Um, we had just driven hours on an unpaved logging road over ridges, through valleys, um, cutting through palm oil plantations and secondary growth forests. And we ended up at the blockade site uh, where the access road would be built to the dam on the Barong River. Um, and there we met with uh, some of the indigenous people who we had met earlier in the day. But uh, the sky was clear at night, which was amazing because just like an hour after this, it started pouring rain. It was unbelievable. But for a moment, everyone at the blockade site was able to look up at the stars, and we had an astrophysicist, uh, Brian Penprace, who was able to point out different constellations and different things that we can't see here in LA. And it was kind of a cool moment, because there was one moment when he said, um, different cultures always construct the sky in different ways. And that's kind of what the whole purpose of our trip was, to see how different cultures construct different ideas, different notions, different perspectives differently than we do, and why those are really valuable to listen to and pay attention to. So, with that said, <coughs> um, this is kind of the purpose of EnviroLab Asia, I think, uh, to observe how different perspectives about environmental and social concerns and how different knowledges are produced in various spaces um, across historical, cultural, scientific, and personal contexts. Um, so the stories that we were able to witness on our trip in Sarawak constitute a larger narrative that is vastly different from the one told by state and national governments, from palm oil companies, and that also challenged notions of globalization and development that we often hear in environmental circles. 
Um, here we have Philip, who is affiliated with Save Rivers, and he was our guide throughout Malaysia, um, kind of discussing uh, the problems and the issues that the indigenous peoples uh, feel are being brought up by industrial development in the logging industries, in the palm oil industry, and with the Baram Dam project, which is currently on moratorium. So the success of the people of uh, Inner Borneo has really shown to be important in uh, stopping the project in its tracks for the, for the meanwhile. Uh, so like Jim mentioned, we were, men uh, we were welcomed by the Dayaks, who are the regional indigenous people who have blockading, been blockading since 2013. Um, the first day when we flew into Miri, we loaded into trucks that drove us deep into Sarawak and we were welcomed at lunch, pictured here, um, by a lot of the activists on the ground who didn't necessarily speak our language, but who nonetheless, there were like 40 of them, they shook every single one of our hands as we came to lunch, uh, which was incredible. And that's where we first started hearing um, why they so adamantly believed that the dam should not be constructed, and they voiced their frustrations about the government that was not they felt representing their interests. Um, their homes, their lives, and their identities so closely tied to their sense of place um, were at stake, so we began to understand. And we asked the question, economic development, yes, but for whom? We also met with people at an oil palm plantation um, who said that an outside company had come to their land and began planting oil palm plants without their consent. Uh, their protests over land rights have garnered no response from the company, and in courts the government has offered meager monetary compensation um, for their relocation, which these local people have refused. Uh, the Dayaks have also always known where the communal boundaries are, so some of our interviews uh, revealed, and they point to cemeteries that are centuries of old, um, <coughs> old land occupation as one bit of proof um, for the reason why they believe this land is theirs. Uh, but these boundaries, of course, are neither respected nor recognized by the government, um, which is, as Jim mentioned, considered state property. Um, so these economic land concessions, which are doled out by the state, create a lot of tensions between indigenous groups and industrial development with uh, the plantations that are being rapidly trans that are rapidly transforming the landscape of Borneo. Um, and on the plantation, our interviewers also told us that. Uh, a lot of the labor, as Jim mentioned, is coming from outside the area. So, really that's leaving very few options for these indigenous folks. Uh, so, yes, we continued driving along uh, logging roads, past, past flatbeds carrying timber, trucks carrying palm oil fruits, and through secondary forest and miles and miles of plantations. Uh, the local people we stayed with, both at the dam blockade site, pictured here, uh, and in the longhouse on the second night of our trip, identified as Kanan and Kayan, and they have set up these blockades to, prote to protest the proposed construction of the dam, um, which would displace 20,000 people in the region, as well as flood 400 square kilometers of forest. This project is part of broader development goals across Asia, um, and though those have been talked about in higher up levels of government, it's very clear once you're on the ground that there is no capacity for the power that would be generated by this hydro dam, and there's also no infrastructure to support it. From the perspective of the Dayaks, uh, any economic benefits would not be shared equally with the community, and choices are being made in the government which they do not participate in, um, and they are clinging to shreds of autonomy that they have cultivated for, for generations. Uh, and this is important because it really reveals a central tension in Malaysia, which is that land rights are hotly contested and it has to do entirely with incompatible systems of governance between people who have been on the land for generations and a government which in many ways um, fails to recognize that uh, long-standing tradition and heritage. So Save Rivers and the Dayaks we met were adamant about having the Malaysian government respect their rights and specifically their right to self-determination. Um, and to involve everyone in discussions about development plans, which are currently being carried out without free, prior, and informed consent. Uh, this is what happened in Bakun, the dam that Jim was talking about earlier, which has already been built, um, and has kind of brought a lot of awareness to Inner Borneo about what exactly will happen when these dam projects go in. So, uh, what Philip was saying uh, a lot was that 
in Bakun, nobody really knew what was going on when this industrial development was occurring. There was no organization. They were promised um, to have great amenities offered to them by the government when the stand was built, um, but they were displaced and a, a slew of environmental conditions have, have ensued that have um, not fulfilled, that not brought them up to what they expected from the dam. And so because of that uh, case example, a lot of indigenous people have rallied behind the protests at the Brown Dam. So I am very passionate about conversations around development. And actually, Isabel, another fellow, and I are in a class here at Claremont called Gender, Environment, and Development with Professor Harold Menzies, who's in the back. And we were talking about uh, debates around damming, um, about activist strategies, and about deforestation. And I think that's a really important thing. I mean, as Johan mentioned earlier, a central tenet of EnviroLab Asia is to continue conversations on campus and to connect spaces, um, to continue to learn from and with uh, communities across the world. And so a, a central question that I had while in Borneo was, um, what am I doing here in the first place? And what am I going to do with this information that I've just received from a new vantage? And that's one that I'm really happy to continue care. Those are questions I'm continuing to carry out and ask um, with my fellows here, but also in classes in Claremont. Um, so that's important. Um, and basically, I was really taken with the narratives of the Dayak people. Um, and I was reminded by, uh, well, so this is the dam blockade site um, that has been put up 14 times and taken down even more than that um, by the indigenous people. And there's a big cross, as you'll see, which was kind of jarring coming all the way to inner Borneo to see. Um, but it's a reminder, I think, that the Christian influence and uh, the development of even places as rural and remote as Borneo um, are tied up wholly with the history of Western influence. Um, so these are continuing ways to think about how environmental issues and social conditions are shaped even in remote corners of the world. Um, and perhaps a less surprising but equally profound observation I had uh, was that the inextricable link between the dyaks and the landscapes that have fostered their existence for generations um, is still alive and well. So this is an image of us at the, at the longhouse on our second night in inner Borneo. Um, and hearing from them on the ground revealed that the perseverance and activist activities make sense because this is more than just a political issue, it's a deeply, deeply personal one. This is Philip dancing. <laughs> um, so last semester or last spring I studied abroad in Cambodia and Vietnam, um, where I encountered many similar environmental narratives on a national and a personal level that resonated a lot with my experience in Malaysia. Um, and I think the important thing that I learned is that from these experiences, uh, evaluating, evaluating a variety of stakeholders' perspectives in decision making that affects a, a variety of entities is critical in any, in any kind of environmental policy conversation. Um, perhaps I will never be able to identify what the worldview that sees everything from the stars to the notion of development in vastly different ways. Um, than I do, but the first step in achieving social and environmental justice is acknowledging the validity of where other people are. And I think EnviroLab's multidisciplinary approach is one way of uh, answering and negotiating this complexity. So here we are. Um, an answer that we haven't yet resolved or continuing to work on is, so what is our role? Um, not only as Westerners with access to systems of power that not everyone can enjoy, but also now as individuals with the knowledge of how the Dayaks perceive their situation. What do we do with this information and what solutions can we arrive at? Um, and to make any solutions viable, I think we all agree that it seems we need to admit a variety of perspectives into the debate. And that's why I'm particularly glad we met with the Dayaks, but also say Rivers, and as Johan will soon mention, um, a variety of other stakeholders in Singapore. Um, and I think to end my reflection on my time in Malaysia, uh, I would like to return to uh, our final conversation with Save Rivers. Um, it was kind of a, a weird moment that came full circle when we were asking about some of the things that the indigenous communities are doing in courts to raise their concerns and to be heard in the, at the national government level. And they said, well, you know, we're actually, we're using these maps, these colonial era maps from British occupation, which demarcate um, where their customary, customary boundaries are. 
and like those are being seen as proof um, in the eyes of the courts. And it was just kind of a, a very weird moment of like, wow, these people are using everything at their at their disposal to kind of receive validation, receive acknowledgement. And it seems to me just so obvious that as long as you hear what they have to say, you will see it as valid enough. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Johan to talk about his experiences. Thank you. Hey, it's me again. So I titled my presentation, Environmental Education, the Live Experience, right, Johan Lim. And so, I guess, I'm going to go straight into it, and of course, you know, we're up, running short of time, so if I run over, I apologize, if I'm totally going to run over. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, so the picture I have here is of two teachers that went to village school, and the thing that got me thinking was, like, about my own education, not just here in Claremont, but back home in Singapore, like, I studied 12 years in Singapore, from elementary to high school. And environment was really a thing that really featured. And we were told, re reduce, reuse, recycle. But it was really something that was like, you know, that was the centerpiece of our education. And it was usually like an afterthought. And usually, and that reflected itself in a national conversation where, you know, when you talk about like environmental issues, you don't talk about environmental issues. The only time it comes up is every year during the hates. And they're like, oh, you know, the Malaysian government's corrupt, or oh, the Indonesian farmers, why must they burn stuff? And other than that, the rest of the year, no one talks about anything else. No, they talk about the stuff, but they don't talk about environmental issues in general. And even in like people's movement to stop hate, which Jim featured, it's a movement to stop hate. And so you make it think, are they really more concerned with the deforestation going on, or the fact that our air looks really bad now? So that's probably one thing. We're a very pragmatic country in Singapore, and I'm kind of put out of the environment, but that's just something which I was observing. And yeah, so, and also as a future educator, I want to, when I educate my students in the future, I want to be a teacher, I want to make sure that I include like environment, because you can't, the, the whole place, the whole setting, the whole built environment is crucial to the narrative of any history or country, and so that's something I want to do. But beyond like the, my education in the past and the education I intend to give in the future, I want to talk about the education which I just received here in, well, not here in Malaysia, here in Malaysia, there in Malaysia, and which how it connects to my education here in Claremont. For example, this semester I'll be taking a class in environmental history with Professor Kazeni, as well as a class in design activism with Professor Albert Park, who's a principal investigator of our uh, research cluster. If no, if no one can hear me, let me know. Uh, so this is the haze. And yeah, one thing interesting about Singapore is like where we went in Malaysia, those villages, that was Singapore 30 years ago. Like, up to like 30 years ago, we still had villages. They call it kampongs, and people didn't live in like high-rise buildings. But nowadays, you won't find one single village in Singapore. We are literally like cleared of villages. We barely have one forest reserve left. So it's very interesting to see like how like snap snapshots in history. And so uh, this would be just the lived experience about you know how we had the welcome lunch like Stephanie talked about, as well as how. You know, we live in longhouses. You can see all the city boys and girls in the little mosquito nets because we don't want to get bitten. I couldn't really put it up properly, so I just took the net and tossed it over myself. It worked, though. <laughs> yeah, but the whole point of that is, like, I really want to talk more about how it really, really is like a really immersive, intimate experience, and it really goes beyond textbook learning. Although textbook learning isn't necessarily a bad thing. So. Like it's really immersive in the sense that you sp like not all the time talking about environment. You talk about like culture, about life, about like perspectives, about like you know the narratives of each individual and community. So it's not just oh we talk about environmental issues day in day out. It's also like really immersive in their lifestyle, allowing a genuine like cultural appreci appreciation. So the next thing I'm talk about is a more emotional humanistic experience. Like like she mentioned about Philip Jaw on the right. And you can see the passion and perseverance that he has in defending his home. And like you can't help but you know have that kind of like passion and like you know the kind of emotional vigor like really like infect you yourself. And so that really clouded my ability to like you know make a judgment call and read the situation objectively. Because it's very easy to when you live among these people are hosting you and you're so kind and so friendly, it's very easy to like really buy fully into the narrative, which may or may not be true, but it's important to like be able to keep that kind of objective viewpoint. And also on the same note, like it made me think about, you know, 
the courage they have against going up government officials, multinational corporations, and like the forces of development, some may say, and how that really like you know how that reflects my own life. Like do I have the same courage to do that in my own daily basis? So yeah, that's something I thought about. Mm, yeah, and it's also speaking about communism and. Cross-disciplinary learning, and another thing that we had besides so instead, besides the immersiveness of the experience, there's also a diversity of learning that we had, and it was really informed by the various faculty and, prof and students we had there. Like in, in addition to the professor from Yale and US talking about astronomy, we also had Professor Mark Los Huertos from Pomona who brought out his like water measuring equipment, and then like each time we see any puddle of water, well, any body of water, like a dam. <laughs> Or not a dam, a drain or a river, and then he'll whip it out, and then he'll like ask us to like help measure the equipment, and he'll be explaining to this poor history major on salinity and pH and pH level and other things. <laughs> <laughs> I learned stuff, so that's really cool. Yeah, so and I think that's the whole point of liberal arts education in the sense that you know we're del delving in different fields, but you know literally in a few. <laughs> So the next thing I'm talk about is development, and I'm really done because I'm you know, on track. And so I felt that the different villages were like different snapshots of history, because not all indigenous vill villages are similarly <coughs> undeveloped. Like some of them are more modernized, some are less so. And the least modernized vi uh, village would be this one here, where we went to the village, and then they had like blacksmith. Like this is like old school blacksmithing, like you know, like really knocking stuff with like hammers and. Uh, like using a hand model driven blower machine thing. I'm not a blacksmith, so I'm not too familiar with specifics. <laughs> but that's what it is. And it was really interesting for me because, like, I look at Singapore and like, I look at Marina Bay Sands, which is on every single postcard of Singapore. And you realize that you know, the whole land that this building is built on is all reclaimed land and how like, you know, this, this doesn't exist in the past. And then I think about how in Singapore 90% of the country lives in public housing. Whereas years ago, like nearly half the population lived in like you know villages, and now there's no not one not one single village in Singapore. If there was, the government would find it and they kick you out. But that's a sad fuck. Anywho, <laughs> yeah, and when we think about like urban migration, urbanization, uh, relocation of indigenous people, and uh, all this was done in Singapore 30 years back. So like, I'm thinking, is Singapore like what's Malaysia going to be in 30 years time? Malaysia hope so. Singapore competitive, I believe. And so lastly, I want to talk about like the whole intellectual experience. And it was really intense intellectual experience. Uh, besides being out of classroom, I really want to like juxtapose the whole comparison between like you know academic book learning, like you get this like little file that we're gonna read, and you know like experiential like narratives, like really buying the human narratives as opposed to just reading like somewhat removed academic materials and stuff. And how like you know how do I reconcile like you know on one hand the activist part of me and on the other hand the more academic part of me? Because I realized like while I was there, like I'm not the most liberal person there. I'm not conservative, but I'm not like super liberal either. And it made me and a lot of people here are really emotionally passionate about it. But there's nothing wrong about that. But it made me think like you know how do I want to step back and really distill the truth from all the various narratives that we have uh, lying there. But that's why I have this picture here with a truck representing like the login narrative and then the indigenous person representing the indigenous narrative and how do we like really extract like you know a really fair perspective but also providing like you know a comprehensive solution and one thing that and this is my last point I promise and one thing that really like set like really got me thinking was at this CMC alumni reception we happened to sit with a palm oil owner and we gave a presentation on violent Asia and all that good stuff and he was like you know it's all bullshit I'm like whoa wow Dude, I just spent four days in Malaysia in the hot sun. Don't tell me it's all bullshit. <laughs> and then he told me about how you know there's only one simple solution. That all you need to do is pay like you know the people to clean it up properly, and they clean it up properly, and that's it. Clean up like you know the deforest in, in sustainable manner. And that was something which made me think like you know while I initially I was like wow this guy's kind of rude, but it made me think like you know I need to appreciate all the perspectives and we didn't get the full picture. And so it's probably like, and so it was a really good reminder for me to like 
step back and like, you know, analyze stuff. Thank you. And we'll be doing Q&A now. So if any of you have any questions, I will facilitate that. Don't go. <laughs> so, questions? Yes, ma'am. The palm trees didn't look like coconut trees. Are they palm trees of, of the uh, orange or palm trees? So the question is, the palm trees do not look like coconut trees. And are they like palm trees of the orange palm? Like? Oh, orange, orange. They, they, they're little orange. In Africa, we used to have little orange uh, fruits. And then you get fruits. And then you get uh, yellow, orange uh, palm. Uh, Does anybody want to take a question from the EnviroLab Asia research team? Especially the faculty. Can you repeat it? Uh, the palm trees, are they like the orange fruit variant or are they just like some other variant? The oil palm trees are originally from West Africa, so they could be very similar to the trees that you've seen there. But there's a wide variety of palm trees. Yeah, so I was wondering what kind of oil is produced, whether the orange oil or the coconut oil. So the, the, the individual fruits are about the size yeah, of a date. It kind of looks like a date palm, yeah. but the fruit bunches are bigger. Um, it's it's the most one of the most um, efficient natural oil sources. Uh, if you compare it to um, so soy oil or corn oil, palm oil is one of the most efficient in terms of the amount of oil that's produced from each yes. each little. It's an orange, uh, yeah. but I don't see it in the United States as much. Mm -hmm. No. You can buy it at Trader Joe's. No. <laughs> yeah, I know, but uh, not, not as much as you see coconut oil. <coughs> All right, next question. Can you talk about the pervasiveness of the, the use of palm oil in the food sure. industry? All right, uh, okay, I'll get that. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about your relationship with the ALNUS? Does any other fellows want to cover that? Oh, I can speak about it. Okay, I guess Joel's speaking about it. So, oh, Stephen. <laughs> well, so I'm not really privy to all of the arrangements that were made in advance, but we, we had very high level support with the a rector of one of the schools at Yale and U.S. participating very actively in our team and really supporting all that we did in, in uh, Singapore and indeed a number of students and faculty from Yale and U.S. Uh, accompanied us into the field in uh, Borneo. So I, I, th I think that there's just a wonderful opportunity, uh, certainly for me, to just engage in all sorts of different conversations with people. I really appreciated getting to know Yale and U.S. students as well as faculty in, in the uh, short amount of time that we were together. And so I guess really the, the, um, the, the hope is that we can just keep the momentum and the collaboration um, moving in positive directions. And uh, Yale and U.S. Has, sorry. Yale and U.S. has also been a partner with us since um, the beginning of the project. Um, I went as the summer intern back in May um, for the Singapore trip to plan for this school trip. Um, and they hosted us ever since then, and we went to meetings uh, and collaborated with them to come up with our original theme for our research courses. So they've been involved pretty much the whole time. They will be involved even in the future, so they have their own research, research classes that we do, and so we'll be like constantly collaborating for example, like the communications classroom, which I'm on is planning to do some like artificial <coughs> stuff with them as co-authors. So things like that will constantly be going on uh, to continue the relationship. And the, the student radio station um, interviewed faculty and students uh, as the first session um, of, a, of a series, an ongoing series, uh, that they would like to do on, on environmental issues. I think mostly around the Hades. But, um, but I, certainly um, our concerns about the oil palm specifically were amplified in that. All right.
the next question. Yes, sir. You talked about balancing your role as an activist versus doing analysis versus, I guess, collaborating with other academic institutions. Is, do you view your goal as producing what you would consider facts about the situation, or you said try to provide a solution? Who would that solution be brought to? Or, so what, how do you see like your, I guess, your goal of the project? So the question was, like, how do you, like, I guess, you know, if I'm saying this right, balance the role of activists and like, you know, as a researcher, and also how do you see like, the goal or the project, like who you want to cater you know, this policy paper and communication model to. And I can't speak for the rest of the fellows, but for me, I believe that you know, the role of an activist and the role of a researcher is not like you know, independent, but it's not necessarily incongruent either. But however, you do need to like, you know, I guess be cognizant like if you are trying too hard to like, you know, push a certain agenda, you're going to like, be like doing self-selection in terms of facts. And so that's something I want to be wary of. And in terms of the solution and like the paper that we're producing, it's mainly a policy paper to provide like you know, so, uh, solutions to like you know the issue of palm oil deforestation. And I think we're looking at uh, catering it to the American public, and also using the communications communication model to increase awareness about you know the usage of palm oil in their products that they consume, that you guys consume, that we consume. Did I cover that? Next question. Yes, ma'am. Um, can you talk a little bit more about the sort of communication model that you're developing and what, what like, initiatives under that um, research cluster will look like during the semester? So the question was to, like, go delve further into uh, the communication model and the sort of initiatives that we will be having in applying this semester. Does anyone from the communications cluster want to pick that one up? No? I think we're going to be having meetings to discern what our next steps are. In fact. Our, we have not decided which kind of uh, communications result we would like to, to have. Um, but certainly there's everything from a white paper to um, uh, video. We took a lot of video while we were over there um, to the video spots. There are a number of things. Yeah, we'll also be doing some uh, on-campus media publications through the various like uh, colleges, public affairs office. We'll be doing like uh, student life and other student newspapers, as well as also I think probably like a social media campaign somewhere along the line. Thank you. We're also planning to create a website with a bunch of resources from our experiences, but also. Um, Grace has done a lot of research on academic papers that inform palm oil use and production. Um, we're trying to create a bank to make an accessible source for this information to be discovered. So, all right. Thanks and on March, March March fourth, we want to talk about March fourth. Say again. March fourth, we we are going to have a a conference. Oh. Today, which is yeah, so in March we'll be having a joint conference. Uh, we'll be participating in a joint conference of uh, with the college from March, March 4th to 6th. And independent of that, we also be having uh, March 6th, right? Independent of that, we also be having students uh, travel across the country, along with Professor, to St. Petersburg, Florida. And I myself will be traveling to the middle of nowhere, New York, for some conference in literally the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so we're part college, so that's the kind of like connections that we'll be hoping to build and awareness that we'll be hoping to raise. Yeah, those are the colleges that, are, that receive the same um, funds from the Lewis Foundation. So we are in cooperation with each other to, to build a, a larger community and come up with some publication as well. Our grant is just for this year, um, and we're hoping to apply to renew it to actually go into implementation phases in the future. So this was the planning grant that we received, and a lot of our work is preliminary. Um, but in the future, we're hoping to continue to be able to carry out some of the plans and the models that we are developing now um, with the information we're gathering uh, into the future. More questions? Yeah, four more minutes. Don't be shy. <laughs> professors always tell us not to be shy. So the professors shouldn't be shy. <laughs> They're good? All right. Thank you, Thank you very much.